Hello everyone and welcome to today's webinar. We're going to be getting started with this talk in just a minute or so, but before we get started, I did want to tell you about some upcoming um, trainings, webinars, etc. that are happening. Um, first up, we have Wednesday, May 25th, we'll have a free webinar on differences in the association between the 2018 ACGIH TLV for hand activity and carpal tunnel syndrome by sex and age with Dr. Carissa Harris and the Northern California ERC. On Wednesday, June 1st, we'll also have a free webinar on diversity and disparity in leadership in safety, construction, and consulting with Crystal Turner Moffat. CEO of CDT EHS Consulting LLC. Our next uh, industrial hygiene webinar as a part of this series will be on Tuesday, June 7th, and that will be on work related aerosol respiratory deposition with Dr. Wei Chang Su and the Southwest Center for Occupational and Environmental Health at the University of Texas. We also have an upcoming in-person training this June on ventilation assessment using bolometers, CO2, and PM2.5. That'll be in-person in Richmond, California. And Dr. Rabinowitz is also going to be discussing some free online training modules during his talk today. So be sure to be putting those links in the chat as well so you can check out those training modules. So for more, you can visit us online at cuh.berkeley.edu backslash about CE. And I'll also put the link to those training modules discussed today on the um, same web website that you registered for today's webinar. So you'll be able to catch the video and the link to those trainings on the website. So without further ado, it is my absolute pleasure to open today's webinar. On behalf of the education and research centers throughout the country, we're pleased to prevent, present the industrial hygiene webinar series. This is a collaborative effort on behalf of each ERC's continuing education program and aspires to provide access to current research supported through the NIOSH ERC programs. We appreciate you being here with us today. Today's webinar, Occupational Hygiene and One Health Approaches to Infection Prevention and Control in Animal Farming, is brought to you by the Northwest Center for Occupational Health and Safety. A few housekeeping items first. You're going to be muted during this presentation. If you'd like to ask a question, please enter it into the online Q&A box, and we'll save time at the end of the presentation to address as many questions as possible. This presentation is being recorded and will be made available on the Center for Occupational and Environmental Health YouTube page. And you'll receive a link to the evaluation and also to the recording once it's available, probably about noon tomorrow. And all participants who logged in today with their full registration email for the full presentation will receive an email with a link to the evaluation, and that'll qualify you for a certificate of completion with one continuing education contact hour. Once you've completed the evaluation, you'll be able to access and print your certificate. And at this time, it's my pleasure to welcome our presenter today, Peter Rabinowitz, MD, MPH. He's an occupational medicine trained physician who directs the UW Center for One Health Research. He also directs the Occupational Health at the Human Animal Interface Training Program of the Northwest Center for Occupational Safety and Health. Thank you so much for being here today and for joining us for this great talk. Thanks so much. And can you hear me okay? Great. So good afternoon to everyone. It's a pleasure to be able to talk to you all. Um, as Michelle said, I'm an I'm a occupational physician. And as I did my training in occupational medicine, you know, I, I learned pretty quickly that if you really want to deal with occupational hazards, you really need to bring in the industrial hygiene, occupational hygiene approach and try to use the hierarchy of controls to, um, to do things um, in a preventive way. And that's the model that I've used in my career in occupational medicine. And I've become more interested in a type of occupational hazard, which is really infectious. And um, having started out in more and noise induced hearing loss and noise control, I, I, when I moved over to sort of looking at, at infectious diseases, I, I really um, felt strongly that it was important to see whether the industrial hygiene approach, the approach of, of hierarchy of controls could really be applied to this because it isn't always. And so um, as I've continued to work in infectious disease, I work a lot on um, zoonotic diseases, these diseases going from humans to, from animals to humans. Um, again, really looking at how can we 
take an occupational hygiene lens to this kind of uh, question. So I'm going to focus today on the idea of doing this in animal agriculture. So uh, at farms with animals and other things along the um, animal agriculture food chain, including uh, you know processing facilities and things like that. And it's uh, sort of timely that we're in the middle of a uh, of a health emergency on animal farms in terms of avian influenza. We have a major outbreak going on, probably the second largest outbreak ever in the United States of avian influenza. And it's an outbreak with a highly pathogenic strain of influenza of H5N1. So very closely related to the bird flu that has been breaking out for the past really 20 years um, in Asia and other places. But um, <clears throat> this outbreak has been going on for a couple of months. It has now affected 34 states and over 37 million poultry have died from it. That's a lot of birds dying. And we've had a human case of avian influenza and which was the first case of any worker acquiring H5N1 in this country. And this was a prisoner who was involved in a culling operation, sort of depopulating a flock of infected birds on a large farm who developed symptoms of influenza, uh, fortunately was being was put on um, antiviral medication and has gotten better. Um, and that, but that is, uh, you know, we know that H5N1 variants can be incredibly uh, deadly. And fortunately, this variant is not turning out to be quite as transmissible to humans or um, making them sick if they are infected. But we're being cautious about it. And so nationwide, over 2,500 workers are being actively monitored for any signs of infection because of their occupational exposure. And you can see that the work involves a wide variety of uh, personal protective equipment and, um, and really very involved operations involving a lot of, uh, of control measures. And this is working in a commercial um, flock in the center. And then the bottom right, it's looking at wild animals because wild birds have been a major source of the infection and, and how it moves around between different farms. So here's sort of a major health emergency. And the question again is, um, what about the tools that we have in occupational hygiene, industrial hygiene, and are we doing all we can to sort of apply those tools in, a, um, in, in an animal agriculture situation. So what is, what is the role of occupational hygiene? What can we learn from what we know now? What's happened before and where could this all go? Again, as I said, my, my, my research and clinical interest right now is in zoonotic diseases as a sort of occupational environmental health problem. Um, these are diseases which spread between animals and people. And when you look at the last several decades of emerging infectious diseases, and of course, we're all living through the, the COVID-19 pandemic, and we realize that emerging infectious diseases are not an abstract concept. They are, they are here. They are changing our, our way of life, and, and we're going to see more of it. And when you look at the number of diseases over the last several decades, about three quarters of them um, are zoonotic in origin. So there's really something going on with these animal diseases that are affecting people that really um, is pretty unprecedented. You know, 40, 50 years ago, this was not what people talked about. This was not the major things causing infectious disease outbreaks in humans. And sort of why are these emerging infectious diseases or EIDs happening in the first place? Uh, because this is unprecedented and sort of what's going on. We think that one of the things that's happening around the world is that the way we're raising animals for agriculture is becoming more intensified. There's more people in the world. We've, we've created farms with more animals to feed all those people. And that means crowding, just like people are crowding in cities, animals are crowding in certain types of farms. And that's a perfect environment to spread to spread pathogens and, um, and uh, we, we, we look at the number of the types of farms in a country like the United States, there's been a decrease in the number of farms in many areas, but the size of individual farms in terms of like the number of animals and animal farms has actually been increasing. So there's a trend toward concentration and larger farms in general. And then there's contact between wildlife and, um, and, uh, and, and people in a number of ways that really is, again, is sort of unprecedented. In some places in the world, we've taken wildlife species and commercially farmed them. And that's probably what happened with the first SARS 
um, outbreak in 2002. It could be related to what happened with um, SARS coronavirus 2, but there's um, basically people engaging in animal trade, wildlife around the world. And as part of that, you get exposed to the pathogens in the, in the wild animals as well. So when we think about some of these big infectious disease outbreaks, um, some of the scary dis diseases that we talk about, oftentimes they've emerged kind of in an occupational setting and the workers have been really the sentinel cases for these. So if you think about COVID-19, um, we're still not sure of the origin, but certainly there were workers around a market getting infected in the beginning. Um, we've also seen as the, as the um, it, pandemic has progressed that certain workplaces like mink farms seem to be places where a worker infected the animals and then the animals infected each other and then gave the infection back to workers, sometimes with a mutation. So there was a lot of workplace bidirectional transmission going on. And then we've uh, also seen outbreaks, some of the worst uh, group outbreaks at COVID-19 in the beginning, if you remember, was in things like meatpacking facilities where the conditions were really right for spreading that kind of disease. Going back to the original SARS um, in 2002, that was associated with live animal markets and people butchering animals in there. There was a related coronavirus in 2012 called Middle Eastern Respiratory Syndrome tied to people working closely with camels in a, a sort of a, a, an intensified production of camels in certain parts of the world like Saudi Arabia. Bird flu I've been talking about um, has been really uh, again, unprecedented outbreaks over the last 20 years. Before that, it really was not on a lot of people's radar. And it has been tied very much to people um, handling and selling poultry and working on poultry farms, poultry markets, butchering poultry. Uh, <clears throat> H1N1 in 2009, a pandemic flu that went all over the world, um, seemed to be uh, having associated with swine in uh, agriculture. And there was basically um, flu that was coming from people back to swine, uh, uh, again, just like on the mink farms, sort of this bi-directional transmission, and then um, and potential for swine to give infections to people as well. We've seen that go back and forth. And uh, Nipah virus, another very worrisome um, virus several decades ago, really broke out, originally was in fruit bats, but then it moved into um, pig farms and then the swine workers were the first cases. So in many of these emerging events, it's really been the workplace that's the front lines. Here's just a picture of when we say intensification of agriculture and, and, and crowding, you can just see, and you can think about from industrial hygiene point of view, um, what are the uh, what what are the the hazards that are that are being propagated here with this kind of thing, and and what are the ways you're going to control it? Obviously, on farms we think a lot about dust, and there's a lot of dust issues in places like this and respiratory hazards, but um, really think about pathogens as another hazard in a place like that. And here's here's modern pig farming, and you can see some of the same issues of crowding and um, and and waste. Uh, accumulating in, in high concentrations in places. And we see that in the United States, it's not just an international thing. We, we, we just talked about the bird flu case about 10 days ago in Colorado, um, but we've seen um, exposures in workplaces. We've had mink farms infected in the United States. And even before COVID and bird flu, there were diseases like E. coli 0157, a bacterial disease which um, people are exposed to around cattle. Q fever has been around for uh, quite a while, first described in abattoir workers in Australia who are working with livestock and it's, a, it's another bacterial infection, uh, which is, a, and some of these by the way are bioterrorism agents. So Q fever and is a potential bioterrorism agent as well. Salmonella is a pathogen um, which is very common in poultry and some other animals like pigs. And so people working with pigs and poultry are exposed to that. And then parasitic diseases uh, like cryptosporidium causes diarrhea and uh, very easy to get that if you work around calves on a dairy farm. So, so this is not just an abstract concept. Again, we're seeing that uh, a lot. And we're, and we're wondering uh, with the origins of COVID, which are still a little mysterious, um, we, we still think that this was a zoonotic event of somehow jumping from a bat to another intermediate animal and then to people very likely in the setting of some sort of workplace. 
And as I mentioned, this can be bidirectional transmission, um, what we call reverse zoonoses, where, where people who have an infection can give it to the animals. And if you're a farmer, you really care about that because think about this as their production and it's the and, and it affects the, um, the the productivity and the welfare of the animals. And so the um, producers really want to prevent infections to the animals. And sometimes those infections could be coming from the workers. It's very well seen on um, in swine farming that an infected, uh, that, that a worker infected with influenza can give that influenza to pigs. And, and in fact, it's probably likely that many more people infect pigs than the other way around because pigs are very good at getting flu from people. Um, tuberculosis, uh, we've seen can go from an infected worker to, to, a, to a cow. And um, bacteria on the hands of a worker could go to the cow and, um, and, and cause things like a mastitis. So if you're in a milking shed and you have bacteria in your hands and there's a, there's a way that that can get to the animal that could infect the animal as well. And then, as I mentioned, COVID-19 has been going back and forth. So when you start talking about farming, you really start talking about producing uh, food and doing it in a safe way. And when you talk about animal farming, you, you have to talk about things that are good for the health of the animals and the safety of the animals. So when you talk about occupational hygiene in this setting, you're really thinking about workers, but you're also thinking about preventing transmission of diseases to animals as well. So hopefully there can be sort of a win-win situation there. And this is just an example of COVID on the work farms. So on the mink farms. So you know, why should we care so much about this? I think, I think it's pretty obvious that um, if there are major outbreaks being tied to infections on farms, I think we should be generally doing something about that. The, the fact is that um, you can have transmission between animals and people and also people to people transmission on farms. But, but farm workers are really special because they have close contact with animals and can get infected from the animals and they could also then bring those infections back to their family, their community, and be sort of the bridge to the community for an outbreak as well. So that really there's a, there's a value to, if we could control infectious diseases better in the work site, that's gonna be good for, um, for the workers, it's gonna be good for the community, and it's good for the animals as well. And that's really sort of the ideal here. So, we, we know that um, there are health and safety hazards on, on farms. We know that um, in, in general, some of the, uh, the, the, the effort of regulatory agencies has been for occupational health and safety has been sometimes more concentrated on industry, manufacturing, other industries compared to agriculture. But I, th I think that um, we really have to take another look at that and say, uh, should infectious diseases be part of our emphasis when we start looking at health and safety issues on, on farms? So traditionally, we've looked at um, all, the, all the significant hazards that workers on farms are exposed to, like injury risks and dust chemicals and heat and cold. But, um, but I think infections need to have a greater emphasis because they can cause a whole lot of different conditions. They can, they can put people out of work and they can make, um, again, animals sick and they can be a bridge to the community. So there, in general, as I mentioned, there's just fewer regulations about farm worker health than there are, say, about workers in a healthcare institution. So um, just as, as, as an example, um, if you work in a hospital, there's an employee health um, service and you, and you get checked out by employee health and there's industrial hygiene um, to, to check on conditions around the hospital. That generally doesn't happen around a, around a farm. Um, so, and there's just not as many regulations. When you look at the clinicians who train in occupational medicine, generally that often does not include very much um, training on things like infectious disease risks on farms. So that if, you're, if a worker's going to a occupational center or just to their regular doctor, that doctor may not know much about what they're really being exposed um, to. And um, <clears throat> basically the, the patients who go to their, uh, if, if you're a worker and you're sick, you may not 
explain to the healthcare provider uh, enough about your potential zoonotic exposures as well. Many workers on uh, farms in general and animal farms as well are uh, temporary or, or immigrant um, migrant workers who may not have their own health insurance and um, or sick leave coverage. So there may be a, a push to keep working when they're sick and there may not be preventive health programs like flu vaccine drives and things like that. So in general, the hygiene of the workplace needs attention, but so does really the health of the workers in that way. So there are a few things going on on animal farms, which are really important to think about when we think about applying the occupational hygiene um, paradigm, which is that there, there is work going on to keep the animals and the herds healthy. And there's a tradition of that. Um, and that's generally goes by the word biosecurity, where you have things like foot baths, like you see here, really trying to avoid spreading a disease from one farm to another, from one herd to another. And so farms have, have realized that it's, it's a really good farming practice to prevent those kind of infectious disease spreads. And the other emphasis that goes on on farms, because you're producing food, you care about food safety and you wanna do everything you can to prevent uh, excess contamination of the food. So we're, we're, we're already taking measures on farms to protect the animals. We're already taking measures to protect the food. And now can we do something more to really focus on the workers and, the, and kind of the, the hygiene of the workplace? So this is uh, food safety, which um, is super important. And um, many of the, uh, you know, the causes of foodborne outbreaks are actually uh, infectious diseases related to animals. It could be related to the manure or some other contacts with animals. And so even if it's a vegetable, like a lettuce outbreak of food, of uh, foodborne illness, a lot of times you can trace it back to an animal source at some point. Um, and the food safety um, paradigm is to do things like hazard analysis, critical control points, where you look at the whole production line of creating the, the food. And is there a particular sort of um, point, uh, critical point where contamination should occur? And how can you focus on preventing that kind of contamination in a place like that? So there's sort of that approach going on around farms and food production chains. And then, as I mentioned, farm biosecurity is how to keep a particular um, pathogen from entering a farm or leaving a farm. This is going on in a big way right now with bird flu. There's, there's basically, um, they take a farm where there is bird flu been identified and really try to kind of shut it down and keep any, anything from getting out of the farm that could um, spread to other farms. And there's also an, an effort to keep wild birds or other sources of introduction of virus from getting into farms. And so that's sort of a biosecurity approach to things. And it can vary depending on the type of farm and the type of, of setting. So sometimes you have very biosecure facilities, some poultry facilities, some, some swine facilities have people showering in and out and, um, and putting on dedicated clothing and, and, and you're taking a lot of measures to keep, again, um, infections from going between farms, between herds, um, and and uh, in and out of a in and out of a farm, and so this is considered just really part of good farming practice. And I think it's really something we can build on to enhance occupational hygiene and worker health on a on a farm like that. So how can we sort of understand the programs that are already going on, and then see how um, by paying more attention to the workers, how can this actually be good both for the workers and for the animal health as well and the health of the community. So there's another term that is used when you talk about pathogens, uh, has not been used much on farms before, but we're sort of in, it's suggesting that it be used more and it's infection prevention and control. And this is really a, a systematic approach to prevention of infections. It's really what is used in, uh, in healthcare settings to um, when, when you have isolation of patients with, uh, with, with COVID-19 or tuberculosis or, um, or, or measles or anything. These are all the measures you take to prevent um, a healthcare associated infection, either an infection of another patient or infection of a healthcare worker. And it's a, um, you know, really has a lot of 
grounding in, in understanding the infections and the epidemiology of those infections, as well as sort of creating sustainable systems for people to be careful all the time about infections, good hand washing, um, avoidance of needle sticks and things like that. So it's, uh, it, it's got a lot of overlap with the industrial hygiene, but it really uh, is the way it's talked about in healthcare settings. And so can you take this sort of IPC, infection prevention control concept, which um, is really focused on having a, a healthcare workplace where the, the patients are safe and the workers are safe, and then transfer that to a farm where in a sort of analogous way, you want the workers to be safe and you want the animals to be safe. And really, and really have this seen by the producers that this is a worker health uh, intervention that is really aimed at benefiting animal health as well. And then there's biosafety, which often folks sort of we use around the laboratory setting a lot. We're often talking about uh, certainly how not to get infected if you're a worker, but also how to prevent large scale releases of pathogens from a, from a laboratory. And uh, you know what are all the adequate measures there? And you can take some of those concepts and also apply them to this challenge of working on farms. So <clears throat> you also need to kind of bring in the health side and the healthcare providers and um, have occupational hygiene on a farm, look at doing sort of a hazard analysis about uh, how much exposure there is, what, what kind of controls can be put in place to reduce those risks, and then have occupational health, which again is really not that organized to take care of farm workers generally, especially workers on animal farms, and, and uh, have that be more of an organized approach to things like uh, screening, monitoring vaccines, uh, and diagnose and management of any sort of sentinel cases of disease, illness in the workers. So if you look at these different um, complementary functions here, you've got occupational hygiene doing hazard identification and assessment, and then applying the hierarchy of controls, where I think everybody on the, on the webinar is probably familiar with this, but just we, we, we are always thinking about if you can control at the source a hazard with elimination, it is more effective than um, doing things like personal protective equipment. And in the same way, occupational medicine had, just has a role to play both preventively when you, when you have people uh, join the workforce and monitor them and their health, and then hopefully uh, detect and intervene if people are getting, getting sick in any way. So many farms, because of these biosecurity uh, concerns, often have a biosecurity plan that is written up for the farm. And they may have a safety program and, and maybe even a safety officer. And so those, those can be really um, expanded to have sort of an IPC plan to be added on to those other components. And as you kind of look at this challenge of providing these kind of services and improving worker health and, and, uh, and reducing infection risk on farms, the, the concept of One Health, some of you may have heard of, is this idea that the health of people and animals and the environment is connected, um, which is pretty intuitively obvious. And we really see it when we see these zoonotic emerging diseases, which are all happen because a, a animal and a human come together in the right type of environment for infection to happen. Um, but when you think about uh, working on, a, on, a, on an animal farm, you really wanna make sure that you sort of are putting together a team approach which involves um, both the people with occupational uh, hygiene experience, but also um, the people who are veterinarians who understand a lot about the animal diseases, the agriculture people who understand a lot about producing the food and, um, and really have these people work together in a, in, a, in a kind of concerted way to keep the considerations about the animals present as well as the workers and as well as the general the farm environment. So we have um, kind of uh, promoted a program like that of IPC on the farm. And as, as Michelle said, we have um, created some uh, online training modules for really designed for health and safety people who work around farms. So it could be the health and safety officer on a farm or someone in an extension service who deals with health and safety issues around farms. And it's to really sort of build out this concept of infection prevention and control programs for farms. 
So these are available for free on the website that um, should be in the chat. And I think will be in some of the materials for the webinar and um, really hope people can use them and find them useful. One of the um, goals of the training program is to, um, is to give users the tools to create an infection prevention and control plan for a farm. So what would, what would go into that plan? Um, you know, it's a, somewhat analogous to a uh, exposure control plan you have for something like bloodborne pathogens in a healthcare facility, um, but it includes um, other things about monitoring the worker health and 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 it really starts with a um, uh, you know an assessment of a hazard and and then making plans to deal with those hazards, which are going to differ between farms. So it. Uh, Again, this is like a template which is provided as part of this uh, online training program. And it has things like uh, who should be involved, who is your team doing this, who is your kind of One Health team, and uh, what, uh, what could they do for you in different uh, situations. What we're seeing on poultry farms right now around the country is you know, a total turning upside down of operations on the farm in the midst of, a, of an emergency like this. When you have a bird flu outbreak, you have, you have teams from USDA coming in because this is a, a highly pathogenic flu event. You have the state agriculture, you have public health, you have the, the farm producer, you have the workers, you have someone trying to figure out how to follow the workers, someone trying to figure out how to, how to deal with the infection in the animals, which often involves uh, depopulation with, with, with chemicals or foam or other methods. So there's, uh, there's quarantines being set up. There's, they're shutting down roads to not allow trucks in and things like that. There's a whole lot of agencies and uh, personnel involved in sort of this, uh, this situation when it gets to be that kind of animal emergency. But hopefully before that, there will be, there can be efforts around a farm to identify the, the resources and, and the partners so that uh, if, if there does become an emergency at some point, it's not total chaos because it often can be. And it's, uh, I would say this is important for many reasons. The workers who are dealing with an emergency like this on the farm are, are uh, exposed to things, both chemicals and, um, and, uh, and injury hazards as well as, as, well as pathogens. But there's also a, um, you know, there's a lot of psychosocial trauma going on in a situation like this at all. Uh, a, a farmer who cares about their animals is seeing their entire uh, flock wiped out. Um, and it, uh, it, it's just, it's, it's been a big source of, I think, uh, psychosocial trauma in, in the producers and the workers too in situations like this that has to be taken care of. Um, so this plan should have a lot of sort of uh, proactive things to, to prepare, pre prepare for and prevent emergencies, things like really assessing the hazards and then really looking at the different types of controls that could be put into place. Um, and uh, again, using that hierarchy of controls, um, what sort of training would be useful to, um, to have once you have your controls going in place, what kind of training and hand washing or other practices use of PPE should be, should be really put in place at that point. And is there an, an, an equivalent? We don't expect that a farm is gonna have an employee health department like a hospital, but is there a designated healthcare provider or someone with healthcare uh, experience who could advise a farm about how to deal with um, infectious risks to the workers? Um, as they off, farms are often relying on the veterinarian to tell them about um, infections in the animals. Sometimes the veterinarian gets asked about the people as well, but ideally you should have a veterinarian and a human health person kind of working together and not asking the veterinarian to make all the calls about, about uh, the risk to humans. Um, so they kind of need to meet in the middle there somewhere. And, uh, you know, to have an organized health program for the employees, again, this is not typical. Um, we do, again, in a hospital, we do lots of this in a uh, in a farm does not usually happen, but things like seasonal flu vaccine for workers on swine farms or workers in poultry facilities 
would be really a great thing. It's not been an emphasis of, um, of occupational health or public health at this point, um, but it would be, uh, I think, a great service to the workers and would also potentially benefit the animals as well. There's a real concern with bird flu that even though this particular uh, virus that's spreading right now does not seem to be super um, virulent for humans, it's only a mutation or, uh, or two away for that. And sometimes there's a concern that in a worker, a seasonal flu will combine with a flu from the animals. We're especially worried about this on pig farms, but it could happen on a, on a poultry farm as well, and then create a new flu variant, which could lead to another flu pandemic, which um, based on our experience with other flu pandemics, we would really like to not see again. Um, policies in place to uh, deal with injury, uh, with, with illness in a worker and, and return to work issues and things like that. We've, we've had to deal with some of these policies with COVID-19 and now as COVID-19 is hopefully waning a little bit, we should really be not thinking that's the last time an infection is gonna come onto these kind of workplaces. And so we should be really preparing for the next set of infectious disease challenges. Um, and so these are other just components of the plan. So. That's really what I had, um, but in summary, uh, infections on farms are an important part of health and safety on farms. And it's not as if it's a problem which uh, isn't affecting other sectors. We think that there's ongoing potential for farms to be the source of outbreaks, which have larger implications for, for, for communities. Um, and, we think that the farm is really the front line where good prevention can, can take place. And that really means, I think, using the occupational hygiene concept for that um, and, and thinking about an infection prevention and control sort of uh, concept for farms, which has this hygiene, has the occupational health involved as well, and really can, can be a somewhat novel way to do a better job at preventing these infectious diseases at the source, which ideally will be good for workers and that'll be good for the animals as well. And it'll be good for the, the communities and it'll just make it a safer um, food production environment in general. So um, I will stop there and um, Michelle, let me know how uh, we should talk about questions. Excellent. Thank you so much for your presentation. Um, yes, at this time, we do have time for questions. So if you have any questions, please do enter them into the online Q&A box for this moderated Q&A time. Um, and also, if you're interested in those trainings, I do have the link for that in the chat. I'll paste it in the chat one more time as well. Um, and then for those of you, if you're logging in later and watching the YouTube version, I'll put it in the description of the YouTube video as well. So make sure you check there also. Um, so first question that we have um, is in thinking about how workers are being infected, are there different diseases that tend to strike different geographical locations or what kind of spread do you see when it comes to the different diseases impacting different farms? Yeah, it's, there's very much um, geographic issues and it can relate to the, the, the climate and the presence of uh, of vectors like um, like mosquitoes and ticks and flies that that could be infected with a particular pathogen in some places. When it comes to bird flu, it seems to be related to wild bird migration. That there's a that, that the um, there's evidence that at times the virus moves north into the Arctic Circle through through uh, waterfowl migration. And then those waterfowl mix in the Arctic Circle with birds from the United States coming up. And then those birds return here carrying the virus. And generally waterfowl don't get sick with bird flu, uh, whereas chickens really do. And so uh, waterfowl can spread it around. And so depending on where you are in relation to a flyway, or to uh, like a water, like a pond where the birds, the wild birds may congregate, um, that'll really affect your risk. So, so part of your hazard assessment, I think it's a really good point, is thinking about what is going on around this farm that um, that could lead to infections in the in the in the workers. And um, again, for instance, um, there's some diseases that are there's there's 
in certain parts of the country, there are feral pigs that carry um, disease called brucella, which get onto farms sometimes. And so that can be one way that uh, a worker around those kind of farms is, is potentially exposed to something. So yeah, I think it, it really varies by geographic area and, and the type of animal and the type of uh, way the animal is being raised. So all those things need to be sort of put into your hazard identification and assessment. Thank you so much. Um, and kind of continuing on that thread of the avian influenza, um, especially with commercial, commercial poultry, you now you kind of mentioned that there's an all hands on deck response, multiple agencies and personnel, quarantines. Um, how is it determined which pathogens are, are deemed emergencies kind of requiring that all hands on deck response? Um, and is there any type of mitigation measure if an avian influenza has been detected, how to best prevent that transmission to humans? Yeah, so there's, you know, a lot of this is happening in the departments of agriculture. They're, they're sort of the experts on how, um, how to deal with bird flu in the flock. And so a lot of the quarantine and all those measures are sort of coming from places like the USDA. Um, but the but the question is who's really speaking up for the workers and making sure that everything is being done in a way that optimizes their health and safety and who's doing the follow-up so um it it sometimes can sort of bounce around between public health and um, individual clinicians and but remember that usda is really focused on agriculture they are not focused on worker health and so um, when there is an emergency, USDA sort of is in charge, but, but it would be great to have good partnership with people who really understand things like industrial hygiene. And sometimes that happens, and sometimes I think not so much. Thank you so much. Um, and we do have a, a question also looking at COVID-19 um, and, and studies that we're looking at COVID-19 immunity impact and on flu susceptibility and immunity, um, what might some of those studies look like um, amongst the populations that you were looking at? So, you know, I, I think that the, like any other workplace, you have to look at the conditions of the work and then are the workers healthy or are they at increased risk for diseases? I think in the, in the meat processing plants, we saw people working in very close proximity um, and the, the environment may have been conducive to, uh, to having aerosols stay in the air and things like that. Um, and the, you know, whether people were getting vaccinated early enough on, so all those things could really affect a disease like COVID-19 from just going person to person in a workplace, just because of the kind of workplace it is. But then um, when it comes to things like mink farms, it's really, um, you know, what, what can be done to prevent transmission if you are working with uh, potentially, you know, if, if workers potentially have COVID-19, they could give it to the animals. What sort of uh, precautions, how long should they stay home? How should they use personal protective equipment and things? Um, it's, you know, who is more susceptible and maybe shouldn't be working around that kind of situation right now. All the things we've dealt with in hospitals about infection prevention control really can be applied in the same way to the, to the farm in an outbreak situation. Thank you so much. Um, we also have another question. Um, the pandemic has demonstrated the international reluctance of IPAC folks to expand their knowledge base to work with others, particularly in hygienists. Or particularly hygienists, how do you suggest overcoming these barriers? Um, when when you say IPAC, is that the same as IPC? Uh, good question. Let me see if I have some context here. I think um, infection prevention. I, I think so. The infection okay. prevention control. Yes. So, well, if you remember with COVID nineteen. At the beginning, we, we sort of said, well, it's probably droplet precautions and, and it's just spread by droplets. It's like the flu, it can only go three feet away. And then we learned the hard way that there's aerosol transmission. And um, there has been so little study of aerosol transmission of pathogens prior to COVID-19. It was really a, um, 
just a, it was not something too many people did. <laughs> they, and including even influenza was not that well studied aerosol. I think that COVID-19 has just shown the world that, that um, infectious disease transmission is more complicated than people think that aerosol transmission is important, that ventilation systems are important and all the things that industrial hygiene knows about are really more important than ever before. And I think, I think people have started to realize that. And um, I think groups that are not allowing industrial hygiene to weigh in are doing it at their own cost. I think that it is a, it is a culture change to bring in things like the hierarchy of controls into a situation where people weren't talking that way before. And there was just this focus on personal protective equipment and hand washing. But, um, but I think the, 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 the toolbox of industrial hygiene, occupational hygiene is so important that I think we have to keep um, building those bridges to these communities that really need this knowledge. And I think, uh, and, and I, I, and I think people have realized that, you know, the average infection prevention and control person does not understand too much about aerosol and ventilation systems. And we know about negative pressure rooms in hospitals, but there's a lot of other things that the, that just people aren't aware of. And I think in terms of measuring, you know, actually measuring and engineering and things that this is, I think it's just put much more uh, emphasis on it. And, and, there's the, and there's the need for skills and, and input that I think industrial hygiene and occupational hygiene could play a bigger role. Thank you so much. So Canada is called IPAC. That's good to know. Thanks. Yes, yes. And thank you for that clarification to our questioner there. Um, just in noting that, yeah, industrial hygienists have been talking about aerosols, aerosol scientists, and making sure that they're part of the conversation. So thank you for bringing that up. And if you remember the Diamond Princess outbreak on the, on the cruise ship of COVID-19 in Japan, there were a lot of people saying, oh, they probably got it from the tray of food being delivered to the door or something. And and people just couldn't believe that it could go through a ventilation system. But, you know, I, I think it really does that. So, Absolutely. Well, and this is kind of a continuation of, of this thread. And um, what do you see as a bridge to get more occupational hygiene folks into these types of One Health occupations? It seems like these positions exist by logic, but aren't necessarily widely recognized. And what do you see as a, a change in, in your time in the field? And also a thank you for the presentation. <laughs> Thanks. Well, well, I know there's a diverse um, group of people on the on the webinar. Uh, I think that it, the producers, you know, naturally are not thrilled about the idea of more regulation, and I, I understand that. But um, I do think that agriculture um, it needs to be recognized that it has industrialized, and it's done so. In, because people needed more food um, and wanted a lot of things like chickens and beef to eat. And so in response to that, the agriculture um, has created production systems to produce that much food. And I think what has to be just recognized is that by, by building these production systems with uh, you know, large numbers of animals being, being um, placed in one place and then processed in ways, um, it's it, there's there's a lot of efficiency there, but you're you're really creating an industrial system, and you have to treat it a lot like we treat other industrial systems like manufacturing. And we 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 know that industrial systems like manufacturing do better when there is an occupational health and safety program as part of that. And we think about the workers, and we think about um, putting in reasonable controls. And the, the, the tradition of, of agriculture is sort of the family farm where there were not, you didn't have a health and safety program for your family farm. But as farms get bigger, there's a point where there's a real benefit, certainly to the workers, but also I think to the animals and production in general, as well as um, you know, releases to the nearby communities, which are an environmental issue. The, the more that I think farms can be saying there's, there's actually some good things about recognizing that it is industrialized. And the fact the term factory farm is sometimes used as a negative, but, um, but what's key is that farms are bigger, they're more organized, they have more workers, they have more animals, um, they need more health and safety programs. And it's an it's a, it's, it's, it's a organized thing that is a good step. And I think 
rather than wait for regulation, it would be great to see farms putting these in place to um, make further regulation not as necessary. Thank you. Um, and kind of continuing on that thread, um, are there any examples that you can think of of folks who are, are doing really well of integrating this One Health approach into their system? Or is that kind of the, the gap you're looking to close with that training that you've developed? Well, we're seeing some producers really, um, you know, voluntarily putting in place a lot of these things. So um, some, some large poultry producers we've worked with have really um, you know, increased the amount of preventive programs for their workers and have really done things like go out and measure dust levels, you know, using industrial hygiene approaches and, and putting on samplers and things and actually um, looking at different agricultural practices that could then reduce the dust exposure. I mean, the, the great thing about having an organized production system is that you can make you can make changes and um, and really see if they work or not. And for instance, with antimicrobial resistance, they've found that it is possible to have a large farm and not use antibiotics if you if you raise the animals in a certain way. So, in in the same way, you can you can control dust and you can do a lot to control pathogens as well. So so we've seen um, sort of individual individual producers individual companies um, really getting proactive about this we had a um, you know one of our meat processing plants in Washington state decided they were just going to start doing a really aggressive testing program and offer tests to the workers and directly connected with our university and were able to really keep the place open during some of the worst waves of the pandemic so far by by being you know putting in all the measures and 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 doing an aggressive testing program and and really um, controlling the controlling the problem so yeah so I see some some uh, hopeful examples and I think a lot of best practices that would be great to get more exposure about. Well, that actually ties directly into our next question um, has to do with surveillance. Um, can you speak a little bit to what types of surveillance, whether worker surveillance or, or animal surveillance in terms of ex monitoring for these types of diseases that you're aware of, or how do those surveillance programs work? Yeah, well, there's, you know, there's ongoing surveillance of the animals on a farm. There's certain, you know, many large farms, there's workers whose, whose job it is just to really look for sick animals and do that. So there's that sort of happening. Um, <clears throat> when there are sick animals, I think it should always be considered like, A, is there a risk of giving something to the worker? Is there any, any infectious risk for the worker? Is there anything that um, needs to be done about infection prevention and control in that way? I think that, um, <clears throat> I think that just as we track certain things in, in say healthcare, like needle sticks or um, people with, you know, how many hospital acquired infections, I think there's definitely a role for better tracking of, of um, disease episodes on farms and, and, um, and things that are sentinel cases that would make us sort of act early to do something about it. So, yeah, I think, I think that, um, having in your know, workplace based surveillance would be one of the best things things to do but having it in general you know our, our workers comp surveillance is not very geared toward infectious diseases in general but when we actually look back at some workers comp data from Washington state we found that a lot of people were actually uh, complaining of things like exposures to manure and some of the um, diarrheal disease from that and things. So I think there's um, there's using the kind of the, the the workers' compensation surveillance a little more toward infectious diseases would be a, another step to take as well. Thank you. And in terms of um, return on investment, have you seen a quantifiable ROI for implementing these types of health and safety programs to see if they work and kind of quantify the, the value that they provide? I've not, and it's a great idea. And it's, um, you know, I think making the economic case is always important. And as a physician, I don't pretend to know how to do that, but I think it's important. <laughs> yes, another role for the One Health. <laughs> yes. Mm -hmm. Awesome. And another question, although not a farm, are there similar zoonotic concerns in horse stables, such as on racetracks or training locations? Yeah, I mean, different animals have different um, bugs they carry. Um, we, we think that 
by the way, uh, th there's there's one or two papers, sort of a nice one health approach on, there's a lot of dust on horse farms and, and um, that can be bad for the workers. It's also bad for the horses. And so there was a nice paper about improving dust control, actually benefiting both the animals and the, and the worker, which is a nice kind of one health example. We had an outbreak in Washington state uh, on a horse farm of a, of, of a streptococcal disease, which actually led to a fatality. And so it's not very common, but there are, and, and you know, some animals just harbor more human pathogens than other animals. Cats are <laughs> an animal that has a lot of human pathogens, um, but horses are, I don't think of as having nearly as many but, um, but it's still a good idea to have some sanitary practices around farms and, and recognizing that farms are not uh, sterile places. There's tons of, 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 of animals around, there's people, there's a lot of manure and, 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 uh, and feces and things, but uh, there's still reasonable things I think that can be done to keep, keep infection risks as low as possible. Thank you. We do have one more question. Um, do you know of any colleges or university animal and dairy husbandry programs that include courses in infectious disease transmission? Uh, well, I'm not an expert on, you know, what types of coursework is in a regular animal science program. Um, I'm a little more familiar with veterinary training programs. In general, um, veterinarians receive much more training about zoonotic diseases than human um, physicians do. I teach the zoonotic disease lecture at, at our university. Uh, that's an hour and a half in a four-year curriculum. That's, that's about how much they hear about it in, in medical school, whereas um, veterinarians hear much more about zoonotic diseases. So, so I think that an animal science program like a dairy science program would, would definitely talk about things like mastitis and animal diseases, whether they talk about um, what happens in the human side or how to protect the worker health, that, that often is felt to be not their business, somebody else should be doing it. And so I think we in the environmental occupational health um, side should be doing more of our part and not waiting for the veterinarians or the animal science people to do it. Well, thank you so much for your presentation today, for answering our audience questions. Um, and a special thank you also to everyone who joined us for today's webinar. Some reminders as we close today, I'm going to put the link to the evaluation in the chat. Um, so for those of you who are still here, you, you can go ahead and, and click that link to the evaluation. Once you complete the evaluation, um, you will be redirected to get your certificate of completion. Um, this webinar was recorded, so we'll be sending out an email tomorrow at noon with the link to the presentation recording um, and also to that um, online training opportunity shared by Dr. Rabinowitz. Um, we, another reminder, we do have an in-person training coming up this June on ventilation assessment using bolometers, CO2, and PM2.5. And our next industrial hygiene webinar will be on Tuesday, June 7th on work-related aerosol respiratory deposition study. And that will be with the Southwest Center for Occupational and Environmental Health at the University of Texas. So you can learn more about all of these things on our website, cueh at berkeley.edu backslash about CE. And thank you again so much everyone for joining us today. And I hope you enjoy the rest of your Tuesday. Thank you everyone. Take care.